Okay, welcome back. Uh, this video is going to accompany sections 1.3 and 1.4 in the OpenStax textbook. So beginning with 1.3, this section studies the functions of human life. And what it talks about is the fact that our organ systems are evolved and organized to accomplish the following functions. Those functions can be broadly uh, grouped as metabolism, responsiveness to stimuli, movement, and then reproduction, development, and growth. So each one of these we'll take in slides. We'll talk a little bit about the details of them, uh, and then we'll move on to section 1.4. So let's begin with metabolism. So metabolism, you know, I know it's a, it's a term we use a lot. We'll say, you know, uh, oh, my brother has such a fast metabolism, you know, or my, uh, or I have a slow metabolism. And, and what, is exact, what does that exactly mean? Basically, metabolism to a biologist is the sum total of all of the chemical reactions occurring in cells uh, that sustain life. And so that's a very, very broad uh, category, but that really is it. It's basically all the physiological processes going on in our bodies. So this really relates to, to the laws of thermodynamics. And the first law of thermodynamics is that energy in the universe is constant and can neither be created nor destroyed, but rather it can only be transferred or transformed. And we'll be looking at, at examples of transferring and transforming energy uh, in the human body in more detail in later chapters. But, but generally speaking, you know, that's what metabolism is doing. Uh, and as we, as we focus in on this question, it's, it's easy to think about it like this. The basic function of any organism, certainly a human, is to do two things. One, you consume foods which contain molecules and energy. So the molecules, you know, within their bonds uh, have energy stored. And the second thing is that we have processes that are designed to harvest that energy and use it to do three things. A, fuel movement. B, sustain your body functions. And C, build and maintain your body structures. So that's really what metabolism does. It, it does these, these two things in broad category. One, consume foods and extract the energy from it. Two, use that energy to do a couple of things, fuel movement, sustain your body functions. For example, just keeping yourself warm, keeping your body temperature constant. Or C, build and maintain your body structures, build muscle, you know, build bone, that sort of thing. So if we look at this, um, you know, we say that metabolism is the body's way of transferring and transforming energy to accomplish one and two, right? You know, it's consuming energy and then using it. And there are two broad categories of energy transformations, that is two broad categories of metabolism. They're called catabolism and anabolism. And I always think about it as catabolic and anabolic. And if you're familiar with anabolic steroids, you know these are molecules that people consume to build bigger muscles. That's a good way of remembering that anabolism has to do with building larger molecules from smaller components. And catabolism is breaking them down. So if we look here below, look at catabolism. It says catabolism is breaking down complex molecules in order to harvest and store the energy within them. And so that would be like taking a glucose molecule in, breaking it down, and taking the bond, the energy within their bonds and storing it in the form of ATP. And we'll, we'll talk in great detail about that process coming up very shortly. Um, but that's what catabolic reactions are. And it doesn't have to be glucose. You could be breaking down protein. You could be breaking down fat. Uh, any number of molecules can be broken down in a catabolic way to extract the energy and store that energy for later use. That catabolic reaction is then coupled with anabolic reactions or anabolism in the body. And anabolism is using that stored energy, the ATP that you've stored up, by, uh, that, you've, that you've harvested through catab uh, catabolism and stored up, using that to build complex molecules from simpler units. In other words, if you want to build in your cells a large molecule of DNA, which our cells are doing all the time as they divide, that's an anabolic process as you build that DNA molecule up from scratch, and that requires a lot of energy. So you have to use the energy that you extracted through catabolism, couple that with the energy required to build the DNA molecule, or to build a muscle stronger, or to build more skin if you've been injured, um, those, those sorts of things. So, so that's metabolism in a nutshell. 
here is just a, a schematic that puts them together. So on the left-hand side here, notice catabolism says, take in energy sources, and as we flow down the page, a couple of things happen. You utilize uh, or you extract energy that's utilizable, and you can see there you store it in ATP. Going off to the left, you can see some of that energy is lost in the form of heat. No energy transformation is 100% efficient, and so that shows you there that you're losing something. You also end up with metabolic products that can be used for other processes. These are kind of, you know, the, the things that you've broken down, the smaller subunits are left over. We call those metabolic products that can then be used for other things. Go to the other side of the screen, you see anabolism. And so that is starting from the bottom, taking external nutrients. That could be, for example, those metabolic products, using some intracellular precursors or uh, other kinds of things you might have and build up to a large molecule. What's meant by bio polymers are those complex large molecules that we're making in anabolism. Okay, second uh, function that we imagine humans or that we know that humans are doing is they need to be able to respond to stimuli. And I'm just going to give you some food for thought here, some examples of the way humans respond to stimuli. So for example, pulling away from extreme heat. Uh, the stimulus is extreme heat. You have a built-in process by which you, uh, you function to pull your hand rapidly away from it so you don't injure yourself. Moving towards the smell of a delicious food cooking, right? That's, that is a response to a stimuli and hunger. Spitting something out of your mouth that tastes really bad, because uh, it might be poison, uh, is a good example of a response to a stimuli. Shivering to warm your body is an, ex an example. Perspiring to cool your body is an example. Running from a threat or your attraction to a potential mate. Those are kinds of things that are our re response to stimuli. So that's a hallmark of humans and other living organisms too, of course. Movement is a, a third major function that humans have to accomplish. And you might think of this really, you know, in, in a simple sense that, you know, as you're moving around, walking or standing or whatever, that requires movement. Uh, in fact, here on the left-hand side of your screen, you have uh, muscles uh, different kind of cartoons of muscle cells, and, and these are skeletal muscle cells, the kind that would be used in your leg muscles uh, to help you walk around, for example, or your arm muscles to help you pick something up or whatever. Here are smooth muscles, and, and you might not have thought of this, but moving food through your intestines are, is an example of movement as well, and that's accomplished through smooth muscle. This is cardiac muscle, uh, and cardiac muscle is used, obviously, to, um, to for the heartbeat and to push blood around your body, and so those are three kinds of movements, but let's not forget cellular type movements as well. These are uh, a depiction of sperm uh, with their flagella, uh, and of course they are motile, um, and, and so this is a form of movement that's necessary to life as well. And I also want to include these. These are cilia uh, that you find uh, in a variety of parts of your body. So one place is in your trachea. This actually is tracheal cilia that you're looking at here. And, and what you see you know, in this micrograph are these little bits of, of uh, phlegm and, and other things that are uh, coughed back up uh, that your cilia kind of move as they're beating along and they can move the stuff out as they capture you know, stuff that should not be in your respiratory tract. So these are three you know, forms of movement. Um, and that's one of the responses of, of the human. Another uh, another important function of humans is reproduction, and here, I just love this micrograph, it's basically an egg, that is the ovum, that is a single egg, with all of these sperm uh, that have, have swum to it and are sticking to it and trying to, uh, to incorporate their DNA into the egg. So I think it's an extraordinary picture, it shows you the difference in the size of an egg and sperm, uh, really, really interesting photo. The next uh, piece is, uh, the next function of humans is to develop. And so this is just a depiction, a cartoon of embryonic development. And here you can see a zygote on the left-hand side. That would be basically when the uh, nucleus of the sperm and the nucleus of the egg join together. You can see them there. Uh, they form a single cell, which then begins to divide and differentiate. And so here's day two of an embryo, four cells. Uh, here is day three. Here is uh, a morula, a blastula. It goes on from there. Uh, to become further and further differentiated. And here's a really cool example. Um, on the right-hand side there is human, uh, as the human develops in utero, uh, you can see kind of the phases that it goes through as, as it differentiates uh, originally into to something that you don't even see any recognizable organs. But you know, as you go a little further, you begin to see an arm here. You begin to see some legs develop, uh, what is clearly cephalization here. 
Um, and, and it's kind of interesting to look at all of the other vertebrates that go through the same kind of developmental or what we call ontogeny uh, in, in kind of very similar ways. Uh, and then, of course, the, the last piece is growth. Uh, organisms do grow. And so once you're born, uh, the next pit bits are just to grow up into an adult. And as you age, uh, these are the processes you go through. So it's reproductive, uh, sorry, reproduction, development, and growth are definitely functions of humans. Now, as we jump into to 1.4 uh, and we look at the requirements of human life, uh, what we can basically say is that there are three major forms of, re, uh, of requirements uh, for human living. The first of which is oxygen. And so oxygen is an absolute critical resource. You can only go without it uh, for at most a few minutes uh, before you begin to have permanent damage and ultimately death. Uh, and so really, I mean, if you're ranking these, oxygen would be an absolute top requirement for human life. It's interesting why. We will, we will tackle this later in the class, but oxygen is required to do catabolism. When you're trying to extract energy from those uh, foods that you're consuming, you can only do it if oxygen is present. And again, we'll, we'll talk about that uh, later in the class, but that's why oxygen is so critical. If you don't have it, you can't extract the energy from the molecules that you've digested, and therefore uh, you cannot uh, continue met metabolizing and surviving. Water. Uh, very, very, very important. As you can, as you know, most of a human body is water. Uh, it is. It fills our blood. It's in our cells. It's between our cells. It's a critical resource. And really, uh, you can only go without water for hours and at most a few days before you start having massive uh, damage and eventually what would be death. Interestingly, you know, nutrients. If you begin thinking about those in terms of macronutrients and micronutrients, you can go a little longer without those days, maybe even weeks for some of these things. Macronutrients include what you consider food, you know, your proteins, your lipids, your carbohydrates, things that you're consuming, big building blocks uh, that can be broken down for energy and also to use their simpler parts to build back, you know, molecules of your own. Uh, and you can go without those for a while. I mean, you know, easily go, can, go, can go days and weeks without uh, having more macronutrients, especially if you have some stored up already in your body. Um, so that's that, you know, it's a very, very important. Of course, you can't go without it, but you can you can do it without it for a little bit. Micronutrients, uh, things that you need in lesser quantities, but are also very important and, and actually crucial to life, include vitamins and minerals. Just as a couple of examples, vitamin A, B, C, D, E, and K are ones that, you know, that we, we often think about. Uh, and those are critical. Some of them can be stored. Some of them can't. Some of them are water soluble and don't get stored. Um, others are lipid soluble and can be stored. Um, and so, you know, the, the amount that you need varies. And, and we'll, we have a whole chapter on this later in, in the human anatomy and physiology. So we'll look at that in more detail. And then minerals. You might not think about this, but of course you need minerals as well. Things like potassium, sodium calcium, iron, chlorine, a number of different uh, minerals that are required for, for metabolism as well. The last thing that I want to tackle here in 1.4 is what I would refer to as tolerance limits. You know, humans, like all living organisms, uh, have to survive within specific tolerance limits. And so what I mean, let's, let's just as an example, we'll use the body's temperature. And so when we use the term thermoregulation, we're talking about regulating the thermal condition of the body or the, the body heat within, uh, within the body. So humans are what we refer to as homeotherms, meaning that they are truly able to thermoregulate. Think of it that way. Um, homeo means uh, to be able to, well, the, the, what this, was, this word refers to is being able to truly regulate in a constant way the internal body temperature. Uh, and so you can see that in this picture here. So look at along the bottom is the environmental temperature. That's like the, the temperature of the room you're standing in. It could either be really, really cold or maybe it could be really, really warm. And you see a homeotherm is capable of keeping the body temperature, that's on the y-axis here, constant all the way through. It doesn't matter if it gets too cold or it gets too warm, it stays relatively constant. Now there's a range in which you're able to do this. And if you get too far out of this range, you'll begin to see that the body temperature climbs. And that's not good. That's going to be dangerous if the body temperature begins to, to climb. And down here, if it gets too cold, the body temperature will tend to decrease. And that's also not good. Um, so anyway, but, but you know, that's what a homeotherm means. Now, you know, humans uh, regulate lots of things besides temperature. 
they regulate uh, water, they regulate pH, they regulate uh, solute content like ion content. All of those things can be regulated or and are regulated. I'm just using temperature as one example. Here's what happens if you get out of that range. You know, if you keep yourself within the thermo neutral range for a human, which is anywhere between 97 and approximately 100 degrees, we, we, do, we do well. We function normally between those, those temperatures. But if your body temperature begins to fall below that, let's say in that 92 to 95 range, uh, humans begin to slow reactions. They begin to become confused. Uh, they often lose consciousness. They lose coordination. Uh, and it's, it's not a good state to be in. And if you get too cold, down around 80 degrees, you're considered brain dead or you'll start to get brain damage. At the same time, if you if you move too much higher, notice it's actually not too much. Between the, the thermal neutral range and the range which you get too hot is actually only 5 degrees. Once you hit 105, you are in major problem. Tissue damage, liver damage, brain damage, death will follow in this range of 105 to 110. You cannot survive this very long. You can go a lot farther down here. So from the thermal uh, neutral range bottom of 97 down to where you start to get brain damage, that's actually 17 degrees. So we, we kind of live, or we maintain our body temperatures closer to the upper lethal limit than we do to the lower lethal limit. So it's always easier for us to cool down a little bit without damaging ourselves than to warm up uh, without damaging ourselves. Okay.